it's so great to see so many of you here tonight uh, for this really um, insightful program. This is a second in a series that Asia Society Hong Kong has the privilege of uh, working with uh, MetLife. Um, and we really want to thank um, MetLife for their support, uh, not only for this uh, series, which is a series of four. And those of you who might have been with us uh, about uh, April of this year, uh, we launched a series, uh, MetLife Foundation Asia Society Economic Inclusion Series, and we had a wonderful discussion on the importance of economic inclusion. Uh, and, you know, we started off by giving it a general picture, and tonight we're going to uh, really focus on Asia. So we're really honored uh, to have a really distinguished panel uh, with us. And uh, and we also are scheduling two more programs as part of this series. And, and again, thank MetLife uh, for their support. Uh, and also another area that I always want to thank MetLife Foundation uh, for their support is uh, our wonderful current exhibition that's right now at Chantel Miller Gallery. Uh, on your uh, seats, you will see the flyer, the a poster uh, for that. And this exhibition really is, I believe, the third one that uh, MetLife Foundation has helped support it, um, uh, Asia Society, in bringing to the Hong Kong public. And this exhibition um, is, we just kicked it off uh, early September, and it will be with us uh, until January. And so you were uh, also given a ticket. If not, please ask my colleague for it. And we really would like to get as many people here to see this wonderful exhibition, Double Tick, uh, which is Picturing Asia. Uh, Picturing Asia uh, by two wonderful photographers, Magnum photographer. Brian Brake uh, from New Zealand, and also Steve McCurry uh, from, uh, from the U.S. And it, we, we try to do this exhibition um, to really mark the 60th anniversary of Asia Society, uh, Asia Society Global. And if you think about how much has changed in Asia in the 60 years, I think the photographs remind you of the changes. Uh, certain things have changed, but unfortunately certain things have not. And I think this is one of the reasons uh, this series is designed to address uh, about economic inclusion. Yes, we have made a lot of progress, but there is still a lot of work uh, that needs to be done. So we're delighted that you can all be with us tonight um, for for the second of this series. And really, um, and I look forward to seeing you all back for the future. I think we're going to address other issues um, along the line of um, perhaps youth, uh, I think women in the for workforce and other uh, women of, in Asia and uh, opportun economic opportunities for women in Asia and also entrepreneurship uh, and employability about youth. So these are some of the topics that we're looking at uh, for the future. So I hope you will come back and join us for that. Uh, so without further ado, I want to introduce our good friend, uh, Chris Townsend, president of MetLife Asia. I think Chris arrived by the same time this center uh, formally kicked off uh, four years ago, four and a half years ago. So in some ways, uh, I think Chris has grown with us and we're delighted uh, for Chris's uh, continuous support. And Chris, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Alison. Uh, let me add my, um, my warm welcome to you all this evening. Thank you for spending time with us. This is, a, this is an important subject and it's great that you've decided to allocate your time to this. So Asia um, is obviously an incredible region in terms of the, the cultural diversity, the, the pace of economic change, rapid technology development, and I think an unwavering sort of sense of optimism which permeates around the region. So it's a great place to, to live and work. Um, and as all these changes take place, it pulls a lot of people with it in terms of the, the economic prosperity. But we're here tonight because there's a lot of people that miss out on on all of this upside and miss out in terms of these positive changes and many miss out in terms of access to, to proper financial services. If I can just give you some numbers of the two billion people in the world that are not financially included, two thirds of them are right here in Asia. Okay? And of all of the people that live in Asia, one third live on less than a dollar fifty per day. And the final number one quarter of all people in Asia do not have a bank account. Okay? So if you think about this massive global financial system, it simply passed a lot of people by, which is very wrong. Individuals in rural areas are much more impacted by this, um, given the, the tyranny of distance from urban centers and financial 
um, services, and they have very rudimentary financial services, predominantly in cash, which leaves people very open to fraud, to theft, and other forms of, of insecurity. So to be financially secure requires a few things. It requires access to knowledge, it requires access to services, and it requires access to tools to help individuals pursue their own dreams. If you look at some data from the Asia Development Bank, we know that there's a, a really strong link between financial inclusion and the reduction of poverty and the reduction of income inequality. And that once people are included, their lives can improve dramatically for the better. And as they do that, there's a virtuous circle of pulling other people with them and increasing prosperity for the whole region. Governments of more than 60 nations worldwide, and these are, this is all IMF data, recognize this connection, and they've created a number of financial inclusion programs. So right here in Asia, the governments of China, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines all have some pretty meaningful financial inclusion programs which sit at the heart of their own development goals. So it's a, a really positive sign. And these initiatives themselves are of great importance to the future of Asia. And if left unaddressed, they could really harm the pace and sustainability of growth in the region. And I would suggest that if we do that, we're missing one of the biggest growth opportunities of our generation. So it's a really, really significant issue. Financial inclusion in and of itself is not purely a government problem, which is really why we're here this evening. And it requires a multi-stakeholder approach. So the private sector, along with a range of civil society organizations, have the ability to bring a lot of capabilities to bear. They can bring knowledge, they can bring education, technology, and services, particularly to help those who are some of the hardest to reach. And that needs to be done in conjunction with the public sector, whose responsibility and duty it is to support the policies to enable the bringing of those capabilities to bear. If I can just switch gears a bit to talk about the MetLife Foundation. Um, the MetLife Foundation two years ago um, changed its, its focus. So it's a global foundation, and two years ago we made a commitment to spend about $200 million over five years entirely on financial inclusion. Um, that was done because before the foundation was rather spread in terms of its mission, we wanted to get a particular focus on something which the organization really wanted to stand for. And I'm delighted to say that right here in Asia, over two years, we spent $32 million across 60 different initiatives across nine countries, and all of that in partnership with governments, with philanthropic organizations, and people like the Asia Society, who were so pleased to take in a, a lead in this type of initiative. So it's really important work. Given the fact it's important work, that's why we're here tonight in terms of this, uh, this economic inclusion series which really is um, the aim of this is to, to provide a forum to promote some, some meaningful dialogue between different parties to hopefully bring assistance to some of the, the financially underserved communities around the region. So we have some great panelists tonight. Um, many of the individuals here speaking have made it their, their life's work and their careers in terms of the journey they're taking us on. And in speaking to a couple of them earlier, I know full well that that journey will not be complete until they've eradicated this lack of financial inclusion across Asia. So it's great to have them here this evening. Um, there's one particularly, I mean, we've got great panelists, but there's one particularly I'm proud of who's here tonight is, um, is, is Mr. Kumar, um, who is the founding chairman of an organization called the Swanwa, Swanra Pragati Housing Microfinance. Um, now, I call um, him out particularly because he was the winner of the MetLife Foundation Financial Inclusion Challenge, which ran throughout the first half of the year. And there were about 150 applicants from this, and we pulled his organization out as being the best in class in terms of providing microfinance loans to, to the very poor in India. So I'm delighted that he can join us here this evening. So the panelists will share some insights for their efforts to battle both income inequality and poverty right across the region, and they come from uh, a number of different countries. So before I ask the panel to come forward, let me just introduce our moderator, who is Carol Yu. 
Um, Carol has a, a deep knowledge of the issues that, that Asia faces, stemming from both her, her experience working and living across the region in the fields of um, broadcast, service, broadcast media and financial services. Um, Carol is currently the head of Phoenix U Radio, where she has responsibility for, for launching and managing the radio business here in Hong Kong, but has also been very instrumental in helping them in mainland China and further around the region. And Carol's also a regular columnist at the, the Southern Metropolis Daily. So please join me in welcoming Carol to the stage, and thanks again for joining us this evening. Carol. Thank you very much, Chris, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be moderating the panel tonight on the topic of uh, economic inclusion for all. Um, just earlier this month, um, actually the news of a mother killing her own four children uh, and then commit suicide afterwards uh, out of despair from poverty in Gansu province in China has raised a lot of discussion about poverty and inequality in China. Um, you know, after the glamorous G20 meeting, the fact is that, you know, extreme poverty still exists in China um, today. And obviously the issue is often even more prevalent in India, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Uh, the fact is, Asia has witnessed amazing growth, as we all know. As Chris just pointed out, poverty still exists. Um, you know, access is still a big problem. And inequality um, has been on the rise. And just to supplement uh, Chris's number, uh, we usually use Gini coefficient, as you, uh, you might be aware, uh, to measure the level of inequality. And Asia, in, uh, on average, um, is about 40. Um, you know, China is about 47. And Hong Kong is 54, even worse. Um, so as we've seen, you know, inequality has been on the rise. And that has blocked upward mobility um, in Asia. And that's not a peripheral issue. We often see, you know, throughout history that how this has led to uh, extreme behavior. And in, and in current day, this might... Uh, you know, lead to someone like the Donald becoming the next president of the United States or, you know, cause Hong Kong people to take on the streets um, last year. Uh, so this is a big issue. And we're very fortunate to have a panel of leaders uh, who have a wealth of experience uh, from across sectors and, uh, you know, across nations uh, to be with us here tonight to talk about this issue. And we have... Um, we have uh, Christoph uh, Bawait, who's country director of UNDP in Indonesia and previously worked as uh, country director for China and deputy country director for Vietnam. Before spending more than 20 years at UNDP, uh, he, was, uh, he worked at the French embassy. Uh, Ramesh Kumar is founding chairman and managing director of Swana Bragadi Housing Microfinance, an India-based uh, nonprofit that pioneered a unique approach to providing assets to housing finance to low-income households in India. And before that, he was a banker with more than three decades of experience, and he made a big decision to jump out of the sector. And Justin Morgan is country director of Oxfam in the Philippines, and he came from the finance sector in Australia and the UK. So we have a wonderful, uh, you know, panel tonight uh, who all, you know, dedicate their lives to make small but very concrete steps to helping to make economic inclusion a reality. Um, so, you know, we'll just jump into it. I think poverty alleviation is a big topic. Uh, but, you know, you, you've all seen a lot of examples of things that have worked well and things that might not have worked as well as hoped. Uh, could you share with us, please, um, you know, from what you've seen, uh, what has been the most effective approach? Does that work? Yes. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Carol, for the introduction. Um, before I go into into your question, let me just just say it's it's great to be back at the Asia Society, and like to uh, thank uh, Alice and, and and Penny for inviting me again here. Um, last time I was here, I was coming from, from China, and I'm now in, in Jakarta, Indonesia. So last time I was coming from one mainland, and now I'm coming from thousands of islands. And that changed a little bit the perspective, obviously. Um, but having said that, and as was mentioned, I mean, the issues are, are really the same. Um, it's just the approach and the context that changed quite dramatically, and we'll, we'll go into it. Um, let, me, let me also congratulate MedLife Foundation and Asia Society for, for, for the topic you choose. Uh, I think it's the most timely topic. Um, 
one reason for that is, you know, one of the new motto, really the new mantra of the global development agenda is leave no one behind. And that's something that all the countries have embraced last year at the UN and we're now, you know, trying to implement. So economic inclusion for all, for me, really resonates with leave no one behind. So that's one reason. I think the second reason is that you included inequality. And actually a big change between the previous development agenda and the new development agenda is that inequality made it into the agenda, which was not, you know, obvious, which was not to be taken for granted. But actually the government have agreed to actually put inequality as one of the goals and with, you know, a number of very good reasons. And you gave us very, you know, very convincing, um, very convincing uh, figures about the, you know, the depth of inequalities in Asia. Um, now, going to your question, um, if we want to talk about poverty reduction, yeah, I think we can find a number of good approaches in, uh, in Asia. Um, obviously, China, Indonesia, but also Vietnam have been very successful in, in poverty reduction. But if we want to talk about success, um, for inequality reduction, I think you have to travel much further away. I think we probably need to go to South America, Latin America, Brazil. So my observation is that the success in Asia is one of poverty reduction. It's not one on inequality reduction. Inequality reduction have been actually, you know, achieved in quite striking terms in, in countries like Brazil, with education, with social programs, Bolsa Familia being the main one. So now the challenge for Asia is to continue with the poverty reduction, make sure that we don't slow down, because at the moment we're slowing down in quite a number of countries, like Indonesia, and at the same time tackle inequalities and make sure that we tackle, tackle it in, 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 in concrete terms. Now, in terms of successful example, I mean, I, I'll just give one, and actually it doesn't come from, from government. If you look at um, uh, something that has really worked, something that was very innovative and worked, uh, uh, it's, it was at the city level in Indonesia, I'm referring to Indonesia now, is uh, in Jakarta, the capital city, where the government of the municipal government, uh, headed by someone who is now the president of Indonesia, actually, actually started uh, a, a Jakarta smart card, um, which was actually interesting in several respects. I mean, use of technology. I mean, do something that is actually, you know, technology-based, and that is actually aiming at those people who needed to have some support, the poorest in the city, um, and to get them into education. So it was basically a voucher type system that um, allowed um, 300,000, if I remember correctly, of students and families to actually get subsidies, get allocations for education. And if you think about the best way to um, pursue both poverty eradication and inequality reduction. Education is probably one of the key. So that's one of the striking examples. I think now the challenge is really to try to replicate what has worked at a, a big city level to a nationwide level with, you know, 17,000 islands, not all of them inhabited. And that's actually one of the big challenges of Indonesia. Um, there are other, you know, uh, interesting examples, but maybe we can talk about them later on. Thank you, Krista. Yeah, education is definitely the way to lift people out of poverty for you know for um, you know for the long term. Uh, and Ramesh, you must have very a very uh, you know interesting examples to share from your own experience. Uh, thank you, Carol, and uh, thanks to MetLife Foundation and Asia Society for both choosing such a topic, which is of course close to my heart and which is very relevant to very large populations in Asia, and also for bringing uh, us over here for this opportunity. Probably, if we look at our journey over the last 200 years, what have we done better as a world? Probably in terms of technology, science, in terms of maybe education, in terms of improving standards of living and wealth, in terms of creating comforts and luxuries in terms of constructions, technology, various areas, we have come a long way. But if we look at these two aspects of poverty and inequality, have we really made, a, made the journey successful? Have we really made a difference? Probably not. If you look at 1820 and probably 1960, I mean 2016 now, uh, still very large percentages of the world's population are below poverty line and they are 
not having the subsistence level of income earnings and the inequalities if anything if poverty has slightly reduced inequality has increased many fold poverty has been looked at as a major challenge for humanity a lot of multilateral and national level policy prescriptions have been uh, undertaken and they have been implemented with limited success in many countries frequently governments have tried to do a lot at the same time as uh, christoph said poly- uh, poverty has many dimensions through which it needs to be addressed education is one very very important dimension health hygiene sanitation water housing these are all dimensions which if tackled there would be an impact on poverty there would be an impact on inequality but when very uh, comprehensive umbrella type of programs have been undertaken frequently they have been populist but they have failed in india we have had several examples of these in the past several poverty alleviation programs have been undertaken by the government but many of them have had very limited results all experts agree that if specific areas are targeted and very focused programs are implemented they are likely to have better results greater chance of success probably we have a couple of examples in india of such programs uh, one has been the rural uh, guarantee uh, employment guarantee program in under various names with changes changes of government but the program itself has been a landmark program which has provided income and a source of income really for the rural population who are totally dependent on agriculture which is a very seasonal activity and off season they were really uh, facing penury that program coming in non agriculture season being delivered has put some money in the pockets of the rural families and it has made a difference to their day to day life consumptions and facing the challenge of poverty the national rural health mission is another focused program which is trying to provide access to affordable health care for the rural people not a very great success but still it has made some headway certain health insurance has reached out at least to some segments of the targeted population who are able to get care medical care which would otherwise have been very costly and unaffordable for them in terms of major medical crisis which has become accessible to them but there are many other areas where this needs to be done if you take the area uh, sector of i am mean, area of inequality i think we have done much worse in the last 2 200 years than in the areas of tackling poverty and the strange thing is that inequality is not a problem only for the developing world it is not only for the emerging or poorer economies of the world inequality is a problem even for the developed economies it's only the impact of inequality how sharp it is how deep it strikes that makes a difference between whether the economy is a developed economy and whether the country has a, a weaker economy countries like india have made significant economic progress post 1990s post the economic reforms in terms of gdp in terms of growth rates in terms of the size of the economy going into multi trillion dollar economy big successes have been achieved but it is also a fact which is confirmed by the various reports of adb oecd etc that the economic inequality has more than doubled measured by what the economists call the gini coefficient to measure the inequality it has actually doubled in the last 25 year or 30 years of economic reform so what is happening is the benefits of economic reform are 
really being obtained by the society sections of the society which are better off even otherwise and the trickle down effect has not happened in adequate measure and that is a very major challenge not just an economic challenge but a very major social challenge and in future if it is not properly addressed could become a law and order challenge also as societies where deprived sections of society start expressing this deprivation in ways which are not peaceful so this is something which needs to be addressed as a matter of fact countries of latin america like like christopher mentioned have done much better in tackling inequality even countries in africa where the growth rates of the economy are not so great but they have done much better in tackling inequality but countries like india and china have not done well at all in this area if anything china is worse than india if india's indicator is uh, gini coefficient is about 51 uh, china's is much higher so the inequalities are increasing faster in some of these countries but many of the countries even in south asia including bangladesh uh, indonesia many of the countries they have done uh, much better in the inequality uh, tackling which i think is as big a concern as addressing poverty in absolute terms so these are some of these areas if we look at these while whenever we talk about poverty and inequality we are looking at issues of food education employment rightly so and maybe to some extent water the sanitation and housing aspects and their impact on poverty and inequality have not really been addressed any in any great measure particularly i can speak with more confidence about india uh, the policy focus on this area has been minimal and even where attention has been there it has been more on the urban housing problems and challenges because the urban homeless are very visible they are on the streets they are uh, where the political leaders the governmental uh, uh, influential people are able to see them but in the rural areas this is a much bigger problem and it has not been addressed at all so far though very soon i have been in consultation with the government and very soon we a uh, new program is to be launched focused on rural housing the challenge of rural housing in india is that there are very sm very small number of people who are really shelterless but two thirds of the population do not have adequate shelter or a suitable shelter so their problem tends to get put on the back burner while that is a major problem because every third year the rural families are rebuilding their homes whatever meager savings they are getting or which they are um, i mean uh, saving that instead of going to improving their consumption patterns and improving the quality of their life is really going to meet the damage caused by tropical cyclones by the floods uh, rains and because they do have inadequate quality shelter they are frequently after having moved up above the poverty line moving back below the poverty line so this in a uh, i believe is a single major challenge which needs to be addressed in india which would tackle not only the problem of people slipping back to poverty and not being able to really raise their standard of living in consumption levels in india but also bridge the gap between the rural and urban divide for if you look at wealth as such i think one of the easiest ways of classifying the rich the middle class and the poor would be the super haves the also haves and the have nots in terms of housing the housing super haves the housing haves and the housing have nots that really describes the rich the middle class and the poor and if inequality has to be tackled the housing have nots have to be made the housing haves i think that is a major area of focus which should be a ma very major area of focus for policy planners multilateral institutions and governments 
in terms of addressing the problems of poverty and inequality about financial inclusion maybe we'll talk about maybe financial we'll talk inclusion about later, later. Yeah. but i think um, before i turn to justin both of you mentioned that inequality has not improved in asia uh, but some would argue that you know by tackling poverty the best way is to focus on economic development first by growing the pie first like in the case of china uh, you know, trying to really focus, put all the energy on developing the economy, and they lifted, you know, millions of people out of poverty at, the, you know, in, in this century. Um, so, how do we make sure that during this process, the benefits are trickled down to the bottom of the society, and even the poor can participate, um, you know, in the growth of the economy? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll kick it off. Uh, good evening, all. And if I can just start by echoing uh, what has been said by Ramesh and Chris, thank you very much for, for MetLife. Uh, thank you very much for Asia Society for bringing us all together here today. It, it is quite an issue when we talk about that trickle down and we see that poverty um, is still high. Um, Maybe my experience and, and maybe seeing it around the world a little bit differently, the levels of poverty are actually reducing, and that's a positive sign. The numbers of people in absolute poverty is reducing, but still over a billion people, not our children, not our families, but over a billion people still are in poverty, and that is wrong. The inequality side of things, I think if we start to look at it... we. We, when we talk about inequality, it's very easy, particularly when the heading is what it is, is to get stuck on purely on the economic inequalities. And financial inequalities, the share of resources is far from equal. The, the share of return on investment is far from equal. But other contributors to poverty that relate to inequality also are, relate to power and the high levels of inequality that exist within power and the, the connection that is often so strong between those who have power and those who have economic power and that those economic gains and the, and the, the well-off. And, and so if you are a, a mother living in Mindanao and you have very little access to the power uh, that central in, in Manila that does exist, the chances that you're going to have economic opportunities are far less. And then there's also risk. There is a high level of unequalness about who absorbs the most risk. We sit here today and thankfully it was a sunny day, but we all know that on a, the typhoons do come through. And again, it's another experience of what happens in the Philippines. And it's Typhoon Haiyan is a very easy example for many people to relate to. While it devastated everybody and it did not spare anybody in its path. Everybody suffered. But McDonald's was back up and running within around three months in Tacloban, one of the major cities. The businesses were coming back up and running. These were the ones that were devastated by, by the typhoon. Those well off were able to recover far quicker. Their level of risk and their ability to absorb things was far better. Organisations such as Oxfam continue to work with communities in the path that are still recovering. And it's not from a lack of investment on resources. Everybody is getting those resources. But if, it's not share, if we're not looking to address the, the causes of risks and the, in, the inequality that does exist within, within uh, risk, it's, it's never going to succeed. And so that, in, in a way, touches on why, why trickle down doesn't always work. It, it's got to work, and, and Chris is much better at explaining on the whole policy side of things, and then it's got to also impact on the communities at the, at, at the ground level. But it is possible. You did ask for examples of where change has actually happened, and the Philippines has a fantastic example in terms of land and land reform at an urban level. It shifted, actually not the resource but the power. It shifted very quickly in terms of making sure that people on an urban level got access to titles. Titles which enabled them in a court of law to stand for their own rights. And they are supported in that. There's a long way to go in terms of the rural setting in terms of land in the Philippines, but there are really good examples of when you do do it, which does combine working at that policy level, getting that right early on, 
but also making sure that there is there is work going on at the community level. But maybe it's an opportunity for others to speak as well. Thank you, Carol. Um, yeah, let's grow the pie. Uh, the pie grows bigger and everyone is better off. That's, that's very attractive. Um, could work, theoretically, but it, most of the time it actually fails. Um, you have many examples of growth which does not reduce poverty. You have growth that does not create any employment. You have growth that destructs the environment. Um, so maybe we need to look at, you know, maybe two messages here. Um, I mean, the quality of growth matters. I think even the World Bank has recognized that. Um, you know, you need a growth that is production, I mean, that is producing employment, that is actually a redistributive growth. So it's not only the percentage, uh, and we have to get you know rid of this obsession of the percentage of growth because there is much more to unpack. Second, growth is not everything. I mean, UNDP has you know um, a measurement that is called the Human Development Index. And you see that countries, actually, some countries have done well in terms of growing economically and HDI, developing human development. You see also some examples of countries that actually didn't have so much of a growth. But the human development index has improved much more. Yeah, I think than China was 46 yeah, in the recent year. Well, you know, it's made. the second biggest economy in the world. The HDI index is only 46. Yeah. So if you want to look at, you know, what we're saying here, poverty reduction and uh, inclusion, I mean, maybe you need to not only look at the growth. Now, let me share with you two personal observations, because the good thing about when you, know, when you come to this event, you try to reflect a little bit on your experience. In my case, I was trying to reflect on, on China and Indonesia. And when I came to Beijing uh, five years ago, one thing that struck me was the infrastructure. I mean, you could drive from Beijing to Inner Mongolia, absolutely no problem. You could fly to all parts of China. Um, when I came to Indonesia, it was actually the opposite. I was struck by the lack of infrastructure. And that has a number of implications. It's not only, you know, it's of course economic integration, including for the villages. It's also access to health, access to education. It's also uh, the possibility of creating your, you know, enterprises connected. So again, the priority that you set um, is very important. And I think one of lesson of China uh, China's success is this investment in infrastructure. That, for a number of reasons, has not happened in Indonesia. And that's actually hold Indonesia back. And again, if we talk you know, about people in the villages, I mean, go to some of the remote islands of Indonesia where you have no, uh, no internet connection. You have actually one ferry every, every year uh, or every month, depends, uh, and reliable. Um, it's quite, I mean, it's quite penalizing from a human point of view, from an economic point of view. I would, very interested to read that actually if you want to have oranges in Jakarta, it's cheaper to import them from China, south of China, than from Borneo, Kalimantan, which is actually much, much closer. So that was one, one, one observation that, uh, that I had in terms of the, um, you know, the inf importance of infrastructure for what we are talking about. Second thing is that you cannot spare the, uh, the analysis of, of the economic structure. Um, and Indonesia is, as a very particular structure. It's basically commodity-based economy. Um, and that explains in large part the tremendous inequalities that you see in Indonesia. Because the rise, uh, part of the development of Indonesia was explained by the, by the commodity prices going up a few years ago. That had made a number of people extremely rich, actually boosted the overall, you know, um, uh, in national figures, but have not really percolated to other parts of the society. And that's very difficult to try to, um, to overcome that, as opposed to a country like you know, China, where manufacturing has been a very important part, which allowed then China to truly spread the benefits of growth, of economic inclusion, from the coastal area, the Guangdong, Zhejiang province, to Sichuan, and then further, further west. In Indonesia, that has not happened yet. It's actually quite structurally difficult. So the structure of the economy has a number of implications for what we are talking about. I'll stop here. Yeah, if I can supplement on those points. About this inequality, what China has done better than India in that uh, in reduction of poverty is really this investment in rural infrastructure, which India has not been able to do. China has done it very extensively. And that impact has been seen in very sharply reducing poverty numbers which has not happened that sharply in India. And as far as the 
other point about you know the, the uh, slipping back to poverty which i want to supplement what uh, justin said is that the if you look at the break up of wealth in general the property ownership and the value of the property would be anywhere from 70 to 90% of a person's net worth if i mean in the urban more in the more economically more active uh, people the percentage of financial assets would be a little higher for the rural persons it would be very much lower for the rural families in india if you take an average it is a 90 10 average 90% is really in terms of uh, land houses and other property assets and it is 10% which is there the average for india for financial assets is 4.5% so and in the rural areas when you look at this if the financial assets are very meager and if that property asset which is the only one which holds the net worth of a person holds the thing if that is non existent or is really valueless like a temporary shelter not a permanent uh, structure then their financial standing goes from a small plus which is whatever the little bit of earnings they get from their agriculture from their cropping to zero whenever there is a calamity like what he had uh, three I mean, in december last year we had very major floods uh, in tamil nadu in chennai some of our clients are there those clients who because who with our assistance had built the house they have suffered their incomes have suffered their crops have been damaged they are about 3 to 4 months of you know behind in their repayments their consumption has been affected maybe for a 3 to 6 month period but if they are not had permanent houses if they had been still living in their old temporary shelters they would have been set back for probably 5 years in their lifetime so that difference is made by a permanent rooted uh, property or dwelling and that needs to be really recognized as a very important part of pre- preventing people from slipping back from above the poverty line to below the poverty line the transitions from one side to the other across the poverty line barrier i think can be very well uh, tracked by the housing uh, constructions that people do when they have confidence in their current level of consumption and the future level of consumption that is when people will really go in for building a house but if this can be assisted it can be accelerated one interesting aspect that uh, you know chris mentioned uh, earlier was you know how to get the poor to become fully engaged members of the society and one way of doing that is through financial inclusion uh, you know providing basic financial services to you know to, food, to the poor and as chris mentioned around 2 billion people worldwide have no access to formal financial services which is unthinkable from such a financial you know center here in hong kong and 50% of the poorest households are unbanked <laughs> um so which is very very um you know it's a critical issue because recent research showed that you know having that basic access to financial um services will enable the poor to you know invest in education health uh you know to start and grow their own business and you know to 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 make their whole family uh, more prosperous so with so many you know different dimensions to financial inclusion uh justin uh, you know where do you think that we should start Okay. We'll see this as the Philippines. If you're in the first three rows, you've got a bank account. You're all right. I'm talking to the rest of you now because you don't. You don't have a bank account. And right now, 50% of what or about 50 to 60% of all of your income goes on food, but around 10% of your income is going on actually paying off credit. You don't have a lot of money to start with. but that's what that's the situation for most people in the philippines but there is solutions out there and it does involve the people in the first uh, three rows so uh, don't be too mean to them to start with it is around the partnerships about what we can actually bring together everyone actually do have different skills on these on on different as- aspects of financial inclusion and when when the philippines government talks about it and and we would say the same uh, within oxfam we see it as it's not just the ability to save or the ability to pay 
it's beyond making sure that, yes, you can receive remittances in the Philippines because around uh, the two biggest income earners of the Philippines uh, actually probably happens here in Hong Kong. It's uh, overseas foreign workers and, and remittances. Uh, is uh, the biggest way, and, and sorry, and BPOs is the other part uh, that makes quite a bit of money for the Philippines. But it's, it's around remittances, but it's also around insurance, and that touches on the risk side of things. It's around credit ratings that, is properly, that is, is properly done and equity as a whole. But for us around getting, particularly getting beyond, making sure that bank accounts is not the only end game because it's difficult to get the banks to actually just want to give a bank account. There isn't money in it so much. And we were hearing examples earlier around uh, before, before I came up on stage about well, even when a bank account is opened, I mean, you can't transfer it because transfer money to it because it's got so many rules and regulations. So the the people at the the poorer end of the scale, the the back back rows, uh, are unable to use their bank accounts properly anyway. So it's around insurance as well. So one of the things that we have done is worked with Visa um, and Union Bank, which are uh, both pretty well recognised in the Philippines, but also now starting to work with uh, Smart, which is a telecommunications. It's one of the, the two big ones in the Philippines. Um, any boxing fans around, you would have seen the Mayweather-Pacquiao fight. They had the Smart logo on the on the mat. That's you know, your reference point. And so, and the reason why we want to work with a telco is coverage. When when you were talking earlier, Chris, about actually many of the people in the rural areas, when you talk about Christopher and, and, and about the islands, yes, we've got our 7,107 islands in high tide in the Philippines as well. Getting access to these people is important. So it's that combination of getting the business sectors together who can actually make a sustainable engagement into this and changing their practices. For, for a bank, something as simple as making sure that if people want to call up, they can do it on a... Uh, in a local language rather than actually having to restrict themselves to English, as is the case for most banks in the Philippines. Um, and it, it's much, much more than that. But that's the other little starts that need to happen. So it's getting that coverage, getting the partnerships, and then it's getting the regulation. So in the Philippines, the Central Bank of the Philippines has been quite progressive. Uh, you mentioned in terms of a few countries it does have a, a financial inclusion or an economic inclusion policy within Asia and, and the Philippines has quite a strong one and quite a good one. And it's actually opening up the doors so that people can engage and can, people can go out and help. And as an example, as an INGO, we have worked with the Central Bank and we are now accredited to do the Know Your Customer Checks. To a certain, to there is eleven points that you need to do. We're able to do seven points of those, but we can do those seven points, which means in any emergency we actually can go the day after emergencies start to get the markets up and running. We can have cards that can be handed out, and then people can use those cards at an ATM or a normal way in which you use Visa cards. But also we work with the remittance agencies, so because that's where people are more comfortable to go to in many cases. So these are the solutions that that are possible. But if we're going to get this financial inclusion, it needs it needs to bring in the government, it needs to bring in the business community, it needs to listen to the people in the back back rows, and it also the the roles of an INGO or or a microfinance organisation also have our place to play. But some people argue that, you know, offering services to the poorest households is not commercially viable. You know, even if they succeed, they, you know, they will probably move up market. So they will leave, you know, the poorest behind again. So have you seen any examples of, you know, um, projects really achieving the balance of, you know, being innovative, you know, providing service to the poor and also being financially sound and, you know, achieving longer term sustainability? Well, there are some early signs, but I mean, we clearly have a very long way to go. Um, I mean, Indonesia is obviously a middle-income country. It's a member of the G20. It's actually the 16th larger economy in the world. And only 34% of the Indonesian adults have a bank account. That's quite striking. Actually, much lower than Thailand and some other countries, Malaysia and, and others. Um, so, I mean, the only reassuring is actually in terms of financial inclusion, you have a gender balance in Indonesia. Women and men are at par, which in the case of, you know, some parts of Indonesia is actually a fine, uh, quite good. Um, so, long way to go, two encouraging signs. One is that, I mean, the government has made it a priority. 
And yeah, well, I mean, you have all these economic, you know, uh, parameters, but unless a government decides to make it a priority, I mean, it's very unlikely to have a real drive. So um, two weeks ago, actually, uh, Queen Maxima of the Netherlands, and, and you may know, it, she's not only the Queen of the Netherlands, she's also the United Nation, um, the Special Envoy of the United Nations Secretary General for Microfinance, Finance Inclusion. So she came to, um, to Indonesia, official visit, and of course we had made a little bit of preparation, and that actually served as a push for Indonesia to actually sign, and the President of Indonesia to sign uh, a final inclusion national strategy, which will then involve the number of uh, banking and economic structure in Indonesia. Among them uh, are the regional development banks. Indonesia has actually a very large network of regional development banks, who have now embarked on economic, uh, on uh, financial inclusion and financial literacy, because the two have to be linked one to one to another. And we've seen some very interesting, you know, progress and and and, and pilot things. I mean, we've been working in the eastern part of Indonesia, one of the provinces, with with that regional development bank, and trying to do two things. Um, one is one with some of the funds of the bank, uh, corporate social responsibility, channel through UNDP, give community access to electricity and water. So it's part of the economic inclusion. But also work together with them on financial uh, literacy for the communities and also starting a little bit of, you know, uh, opening of band accounts, so, so grant, grant transfer. And that hopefully would, would, would help. Um, it's, you know, it's, it, will be, it will be a long, a long process. Uh, but I think what is important that it started and you have the network in place to actually make it happen. We want to make sure that we leave ample time for questions. Yeah. So we can, you know, uh, yeah. of course, I raise more examples when we maybe open up for questions. So maybe yeah. a, a quick last maybe remark. Quick, yeah. 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 Financial inclusion, that it has a clear impact on poverty reduction and inequality reduction is something which has been proven by many studies. There is a famous uh, landmark study by Burgess and Pandey, 2005, where uh, uh, the state-led opening of bank branches in India, in the rural parts of India, and its impact on poverty has been studied and a positive correlation has been established. There was a study by Donohan in 2008, which talked about some of the elements of that financial inclusion, which are also adding, reinforcing uh, the impact on po po poverty, like use of mobile phones, good quality institutions being a very important factor in the financial inclusion, actually making an impact on redu reduction of poverty, etc. And in my own personal experience as a banker and as a practitioner of microfinance and housing finance in the rural areas, I've seen that this impact is there. Uh, for example, four years back when we started the operations, we had to get the clients to open bank accounts. Most of them did not have bank accounts. I could get an appraisal done and approval for their loan in 22, 25 days, but it took me 90 days to get the bank account opened for them to be able to get this money into their pocket and start the work. So that kind of a challenge has been there, which recently the guy in the last uh, two years government had uh, come up with a universalization of bank account program called Jandana Yojana, which has definitely helped. Now when my uh, field officers go to the clients, they don't have to go and take them to the banks and open the bank accounts. They are already there. But the other challenge, which I was discussing with Justin comes in, that these, most of these are no frill accounts where small amounts can only be transacted. When I want to remit 100,000 rupees or 150,000 rupees into those accounts, they bounce back. The remittances bounce back because these accounts would not permit a transaction more than 20,000 Indian rupees. So we have to get that upgraded. Of course, it's a smaller challenge than the earlier challenge. Maybe it takes 15, 20 days, three weeks to get it done instead of three months. But financial inclusion definitely makes an impact on the speed with which this transformation happens, as well as the quality of the transformation. So that is definitely a factor, and we need to take that into account. But financial inclusion, not just in terms of uh, cosmetics, like opening an account, etc., but actually delivering services of various kinds, credit, savings, credit, insurance, housing related access, or finance access, all these things, if they come through, then it makes a difference. When nobody had no mainstream banker, and India has a very strong banking network, 
no housing finance company really entered the rural heartland of india a small company like ours could enter the quality of the institution the focus and the uh, uh, clients need based product development i think that made all the difference where we could crack the code which nobody else could in over 30 40 years with giant institutions with mighty uh, balance sheets and with a government policy prescription saying that you should do it they still would not would not be able to reach out because it was not viable for them so good uh, proper institutions focused on really de developing products for the bottom of the pyramid that does make a difference questions please keep it brief and maybe just one person per person uh, one question per person so we can have more people participate there and the blue the lady in the blue um hi thank you very much for the great and informative evening dialogue um i'm representing the chinese university of hong kong and my question is in the context of asia do you think it should be the public or the private sector that should be doing more to alleviate poverty and create economic inclusion for all thanks you're free any of you to answer yeah my opinion is that it is the public sector which has to lead these programs that the canvas is so large the outlays required are so big and a lot of areas policy prescriptions are a must to facilitate institutions to come in to play that public uh, sector the government has to lead the program but there is a lot of scope for innovative private institutions to make a success out of these intentions in a better way than the uh, rigid formulated public uh, uh, programs would be able to achieve um i think i mean there is clearly a consensus now that it has to be both i mean it has to be the public and and the private and if you look at the sustainable development goal the goal the last one the 17th is actually about partnership i think it becomes a little bit more complicated when you think about which role exactly for the public sector is quite straightforward i would say i mean you need to have conducive policies and you need not only to have them adopted you need to have them implemented and monitored it becomes more complicated for the private sector it's easy to say yes yeah, the private sector has to play a role what kind of role has the private sector played how do we i mean yes it could be innovation how do we define the contribution of the private sector are we talking about in terms of financing are we talking about in terms of how about um investments social impact investment and and that's i think is that's a current debate and it needs to be probably more thought through and and articulated that's probably where where now the the challenge is define the role of the private sector what is the contribution of the private sector to the development goals if i can add one small point uh, see apart, uh, one experience that we had which was a uh, unique was that apart from doing certain work as an institution as a company delivering certain products and results we achieved a lot of success because we were able to partner with the grassroots institutions with the units of the local self government with whom normally only the government is connected normally no other external company or agency gets connected to connecting with microfinance institutions and non governmental organizations maybe they were working on watershed management or health or hygiene or child and mother nutrition but we used them and their knowledge of the community and the connect with the community to really connect with the uh, uh, right uh, targets those who needed this finance and be able to do that so probably some unconventional collaborative efforts using a lot of grassroots institutions also could give a lot of success hi thanks for a very interesting uh, talk i have a question maybe justin can start off others might have comments um i'm i'm surprised that for the customers that you're talking about you have to do eight um aspects of kyc in the cir cir circumstances that those people find themselves so how do you see the escalating requirements around kyc aml fatca um inhibiting the contribution or the participation of the people that you're trying to serve in becoming more financially included thank you for the question before i answer is there anybody from the philippines in the audience 
All right. Okay. So it, it is actually not so bad because it, it is a tough list to go through. But what we actually do have is we are actually able to work with legal firms who do pro bono work or, or le lawyers who have set up NGOs who can work with the local government units at the very lowest level to make sure that different forms of documentation can be certified, can be accredited, so that we can actually use them to be the, the know your customer checks. It is one of the big things that we actually do after an emergency response as an organisation is actually help people get their legal documents back in place. And so it's actually getting those documents quickly is a really important thing to do. And just because I've got the microphone, just going back to the, the universities, uh, the, your question, I, it, it was an excellent question. I think it actually does represent some of the biggest challenges, though, in terms of inequality. Totally agree with you. It's a partnership. But if you're starting out or if you're big and small, your, your role to play is quite a bit different. When we look at the governments around the world, if you're a small, if you're a small uh, country, you're in... The value of actually investing in something like ch climate change adaptation, uh, climate change, and reducing the emissions is quite small, because you think, well, what can I do? It's not going to make a great difference. And it's the same with a business. If you're competing, if you're have got a, a mum and dad shop or a sorry sorry store, as we say in the Philippines, and you're competing against a, a big uh, chain, a big supermarket chain. The supermarket chain or a Unilever is able to invest to make sure that they are doing sustainable development and sustainable approaches because they've actually gained the market share. They're pr protecting it. They're trying to nudge a bit here and there by all means and they are doing quite a lot. The big businesses, the big end of town actually does quite a bit around the whole poverty alleviation but it's very difficult for the middle or the smaller size to get in from the very start with those ambitions. It's about them holding their footprint. But that doesn't, if, if anyone wants to add in terms of the, the KYC, we don't do uh, three, three and a half, and they are too difficult for us to do. Yeah, KYC has been a challenge in India also. It has been a major issue. But even the central uh, bank has come up with diluted KYC norms for the small clients, for the rural clients, etc., to make things easier. And now, as things stand, KYC is not a big issue, especially uh, India has introduced the uh, Aadhaar identification program, which connects the universal UID uh, identification to all aspects of government's uh, activities in terms of subsidies, in terms of employment-related uh, payments and other payments, So, which is improving the transparency of the system as well as making the KYC aspect very simple because it's already taken once and it is on a centralized portal and easily accessible to all the others. Thank you so much for your talk today. I was wondering more specifically when discussing inequality, I guess I'm a bit surprised that gender inequality wasn't discussed and how the impact on leaving women out of the conversation does have an impact economically. So I was hoping if uh, you could provide some clarity on specific policies that have been implemented that uh, you've seen have um, sort of improved a country's situation. I know recently the UN um, and the World Bank have really made a push for including women in the conversation. Uh, I may add one point. My clients are 100% women. The entire inclusion is only through women. So in some way it is getting addressed, at least in our limited context. Yeah. Um, I mean, Mark, actually, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, we should not talk about inequality, but we should talk about inequalities. And if I'm right, I think goals, SDG 10 is about inequalities, and that would definitely include gender, uh, gender inequalities. Um, I, I, I made a mention of it. I say for financial inclusion, Indonesia is actually on, on the gender parity thing, which, which is very good. Um, yes, you can have a number of policy commitment. I think that's probably one area where I would believe much more at action at the grassroots level. Um, and, and speaking from, from experience, um, we have you know, specific intervention in, in Papua, one of the provinces of, of Indonesia, which are really looking at gender issues, including gender-based violence, 
and um, and gender economic empowerment and women economic empowerments. And you can have you know you can have very strong resolve at the capital level. It's very unlikely to produce a result. I think that's probably one area where we have to be present on the ground, working with a com with a woman, uh, woman in associations, um, working with the faith leaders, with the various community. So we. You no, know, we push the agenda of uh, of of gender inequality of gender equality. I think that's really um, you know the success stories will probably happen at the um, at the you know village district level. Thank you for your question. Um, it's the same statistic in the Philippines as actually Indonesia. When it comes to bank accounts, there isn't actually a great deal of difference. But if we're talking, talking about the bigger picture, there are still high levels of inequality between women and men in terms of uh, the financial side of things. I mean, the, the easiest and the, the most undervalued work that is done by, by, in societies across the world is, is the work that's done on care. So caring for children, bringing up families and the likes, and that is not rewarded in, in many societies. In some societies, it is starting to be, there are policies starting to come into place, making sure that there are proper maternity leave. I know in the Philippines, it's one of the things we've advocated for, to push it up so that uh, it's paid for for a longer period of time. But generally valuing the work that women do is a start. But the, 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 the other part of that, I would say, comes to the inequality that exists around power that gets down to the household level. The Philippines is actually extremely impressive in terms of e equality between women and men at the, at the business level. Um, we are fourth in the world in terms of numbers of, of percentage of women that are managers. We are the, we're nearly at 50%. The top three are all got more women as managers than men. Some surprising names. Jamaica is top of the table. It uh, surprised me a bit. But the Philippines is right up there. But when it gets down to the household level, and, and, and Christopher mentioned about the, the the domestic violence or violence against women, these are the types of things that have a real impact from, from what we are seeing in terms of how people can use the resources that they have. So when the, to get access to the resource, it's, real, it's more equal in the Philippines, in many places not. But then how those resources are used is not equal. If I may add, the microfinance movement across South Asia, East Asia, Latin America, I think has been probably the single biggest uh, movement which has given primacy to women and put the focus on women and shown that they are very responsible clients of all these organizations and that you can trust them and they deliver better than men. I think that way, in its own way, it has been a statement of empowerment and uh, assertion of women's uh, rights and their standing in the rural or in the society. We always have more questions than the time that we have, I think. Uh, maybe we have uh, one, one more, one final question. Andrew. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, all, the, uh, all the panelists, MetLife Foundation, Carol, for, for doing this wonderful event. I actually have a question about um, mobile banking. So I think in Kenya, there has been this really successful system. I forgot the name. It's either M-Pesa where essentially it's essentially a digital bank. You go to a, one of you know, 15,000 merchants, you pay cash, and then the merchant injects money into the system, which you can then use to pay other people. Um, WeChat, uh, run by Tencent in China, is already almost like a bank. Uh, do you see messaging companies, whether it's Facebook, uh, you know, WeChat, expanding beyond you know, where they are now to provide banking services to rural countries in ASEAN and Africa? And if not, when's that, you know, I, I'm sure they would be interested. If not, what's the timeline and what are the calculations they're thinking in their head? Justin spent the most yeah. time in Africa, yeah. so maybe we'll I, I start with Justin. In, in I was uh, before Philippines, I was in Tanzania and, and PESA was, it was huge in, in there. Uh, we were able to run an entire country program with never dealing with cash as an example. So all of our, we were either doing with checks or transfers or if we needed to work with communities or anything, any times of payments, our staff, if they had to get floats, was in PESA. The challenge was it wasn't regulated by the banking sector. It was actually regulated outside of the banking sector and that caused a lot of uh, conflict. 
and it, it caused a lot of delay in terms of making that shift. I think Kenya has started to make that shift more progressively. When I was leaving Tanzania, it had not. But yes, they are definitely. It is the way. I mean, we are the example that I was giving about what we're doing in the Philippines. We're working with Smart, which is a telco. But on the back of that Smart card, the bank. Sorry, you get your card on the back is actually smart. It's actually it's a Visa card with smart on the back. It's no longer so they are able to get. They've got accredited by the Central Bank of the Philippines to actually be able to do those levels. So they have to go through that same level of regulators. So they do have a processor that sits within another setup, but that's uh, getting more on the technical side of things. But it's definitely the way that we're seeing things. That much much more is is happening in that in that digital space and. And one of the things that we are trying to do when, when we're looking at the audience and the clients uh, that we're working with, it's, it's all very well to work with the smartphone technology, which is all ready to go. But uh, many of the people that we work uh, with and for don't, don't have the resources to buy that. So even working with the old Nokias and, and those types of things. So that's the type of technology that we're working with, with one of the most modern and, and technically savvy organisations in smart, we're actually helping them to make sure that their technology can work with, with a mum and dad that's out in a rural community just working on the old Nokias. In India, uh, actually, we're running out of time, so maybe just a final word of you know, conclusion or wisdom from you know, all three of you, uh, just a very quick one. Okay, well, thank you. Let me just say, I thought really enjoy being here tonight and I want to thank you for your presence. Also the high level of attention because you can feel that when you're sitting here and also the great questions. I'll just make three points. Um, I mean, the topics we've talked about, the issues we've talked about are obviously central to the main theme. There are also other, other issues we haven't been able to touch. I mean, let me give two examples. Social protection is the thing one. Uh, tax system, uh, fiscal policies are also very central to, the, to, the, to those issues. Um, second point is, uh, I mean, the battle is far from being won. Um, as was mentioned, I mean, there are still some very you know, worrisome uh, system. It's also uh, because in Asia we live in a, uh, with a high level of vulnerability. And let me give you a final figures. Um, Indonesia every year does you know, their poverty analysis, and they found in 2014... 55% of the people classified as poor were not poor the year before. So you have you know, high level of vulnerability people falling back into, into poverty. Secondly, progress is not linear. Uh, I think if you remember the economic crisis of 97, 98, uh, I mean, it pushed people back into poverty. I mean, hopefully we don't have the con conditions now for this to happen again, but we do have it in terms of local level when a disaster happens. Think of, you know, in the Philippines or in Myanmar, Nargis. So project, prog progress can easily be, be reversed. Having said that, and to terminate on a hopeful note, uh, we have to remember that all indicators, in particular human development indicators, are actually showing a clear progress. Uh, compared to where we were in Asia in the 60s, 70s, there is a very strong progress. So that's a cause for hope. We just need to continue that this progress remains unabated. And second reason for hope is that you see a very strong drive, commitment to address those issues uh, by the central, by the local government, and by the citizens. And I think you know it's not it's not meaningless what's happening about the SDGs. And I see that in Indonesia. I mean, the SDGs are really impacting. I mean, the message about the SDGs is impacting. It's not about the goal themselves. It's how this kind of global agenda is brought to the local level, how it becomes now part of the discussion in local government, in, within communities. And that can actually be a very powerful instrument to make for the progress, which I hope will happen. Yeah. I think poverty and inequality are still very big demands to be a tackled and uh, financial inclusion definitely is the way to go about it but when we say financial inclusion rather than a very simplistic approach we need to really make it more multidimensional we need to have a lot more cannons and munitions uh, firing at them uh, some of the uh, variations which even in india we are seeing is now there are a series of small finance banks which have been given licenses to operate in small centers in the hinterland of the country. We have got payment banks, which have been recently given licenses, which will address your question also about the mobile wallets, etc. And some of the big telecom companies are partnering with others to set up uh, these payment banks so that they have the huge reach the, through the mobile telephony and they would be able to 
also provide these financial services they are suddenly increasing their reach to an explosive level all these are important but also my point which i made earlier is that the financial inclusion has to be on many dimensions now savings credit insurance remittances and very importantly the neglected area of housing finance access because that is what gives permanent stability to the financial upgradation of any family particularly in the rural parts of the country I'd like to also just make sure thanks are given to MetLife and uh, Asia Society. It's, it's been great. Thank you. Um, my generation is the first generation that has all the technical solutions to overcome poverty. There is nothing in terms of the, the poverty list that cannot be solved. So I'm an optimist. I think it can be done. It needs the political wills and it needs the individual capacities and things like that. But the solution for everything is there. And then getting on to those solutions, I, I, I really think that the, the progress and the momentum is, is very much with us. There are solutions every day coming about. But often it's the solution that we see is the technical and what we don't see is the work that Ramesh does behind the scenes and all, all of the softer skills that are needed to get actually the changes to happen. So it's very easy to find a... a a solution that you read out of a book and or off the internet now and, and say this is how we're going to do it. It's many of the things that go on behind at those softer skills which is going to, it, it's really important to making sure that any solution does work. And that's probably where I'd like to leave my, fina my, my final remark in terms of financial inclusion. For all the success that it can have and does have in terms of economic opportunity and development and the likes, the most consistent thing that we have heard as Oxfam when talking to people who have been included into the financial sector is not about all their ATM cards and everything like that. It's dignity. And if we are doing this, we are actually creating dignity. And that's a wonderful thing to do. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful panel. And I bet most of you must be feeling hungry now. I hope uh, tonight's conversation has provided some food for thought and stimulation, so hope that you can continue the conversation even after you walk out of the room tonight. So thank you so much for spending a wonderful evening with us. Thank you. Thank you.